beginning of this speech is longer than what I initially planned. <laughs> In my 26 years, I have only written three speeches, and they've all been since I've been mayor. Um, and this one just happened to be uh, a little bit longer than, um, than I normally do it, but it's kind of hard to talk about transportation without being a little bit uh, talking in details. Um, let me start off by thanking uh, uh, Andrea and Jack uh, and Tag uh, for extending the invitation to me to be with you this morning. And let me also compliment Tag for the, from the very beginning for the outstanding work that this, that this organization does. Uh, in fact, uh, your presence here today signifies how important this organization is. And so if you will, please join me in just acknowledging them for the work that they do. <laughs> Let me also acknowledge again all of the elected officials in this room. Uh, and if I called you out, name my name, it would add another 10 minutes to this already long speech. Uh, so let me just acknowledge everyone. I do certainly want to acknowledge uh, individuals. Uh, I know I see Representative Sarah Davis is here from the legislature. Uh, good to see you, Sarah. I look forward to working with her from another capacity uh, with the legislature, but thank you. She is truly a, well, she's already a, a star in the legislature, but her star still is rising higher and higher. Uh, and then uh, I do want to acknowledge these e elected officials uh, because um, uh, we're voting on the budget next week. <laughs> <laughs> and the lobbying on that star is like right now. <laughs> these happen to be my most favorite of the 16 people on city council. <laughs> And I asked them to join me today. Um, and so I want to acknowledge Vice Mayor Pro Tim uh, Davis. I want to acknowledge uh, Council Members Martin, Council Member Green, Council Member Edwards, Council Member Cisneros, and Council Member Robinson. Thank you for all being present today. And as Commissioner Mosley said, uh, I've been on the bus for a long, long time uh, from, from intermediate and high school, uh, all the way to going to University of Houston, um, and it's an essential component, and I, I'll be talking a little bit more about that. Uh, I do want to also uh, acknowledge and single out uh, the new uh, Metro chair, the first woman ever as the chair of Metro, Karen Padman. It's good to be with you this morning. <laughs> Many of you know that I went to TechStock in Austin recently, and call for a paradigm shift in how to tackle the mobility challenges of our state and our urban areas. Uh, we are not just growing out, we are also growing up. Mobility is vital to our great region. The growth of our region has been a blessing. It means more jobs and economic opportunities for our residents. It also means more tax base and uh, enabling local governments to provide enhanced services and amenities more police and fire, being able to address our infrastructure needs, parks and libraries, and the list goes on. And our region's abundant available land, which has been opened up for development by our freeways, has helped keep the region affordable. This affordability is important for the region, competitiveness, and our quality of life. We are fortunate that we have a competitive city which means that this growth will likely continue, which is a good thing. Still, the growth projections for our region are simply daunting. The regional demographers expect 3.5 million more people in this region by 2040, for a total of 10 million people in the eight county region. That is the equivalent of placing a whole, an entire Chicago of 2.72 million people right here in the Houston region. That's a lot of people. So while continued growth is vital to Houston, we need to think about how to leverage this growth to create a healthy, durable region. Smart, strategic decisions about mobility will be key to leveraging the growth to our advantage. That's because mobility decisions of our public agencies, including many of the organizations and people here today, will shape our growth patterns. Land development significantly follows our transportation investments. For example, 
We are already seeing tremendous development activity along the recently completed sections of the Grand Parkway. A recent Harris County study estimates that by 2050, the Houston population in Northwest Houston in the vicinity of US 290 and the Grand Parkway will increase by over 1 million people with over 100,000 acres of land to be developed in the areas. This and other examples of similar patterns in the region have demonstrated how transportation investments like our freeways influence the market and drive location decisions of our residents and our businesses. And these growth patterns and the mobility investment that drives them will impact not just our mobility needs, but many other goals as well. That's why we can't simply think of our mobility decisions narrowly in terms of congestion relief alone. Instead, we must consider how mobility decisions affect other regions as well. Flooding is a good example. Our land development patterns influenced by our transportation investments impact how the region drains. Our flooding risk increases as vacant lands that previously absorbed, absorbed rainfall become streets and rooftops, creating more runoff. Transportation investments support a strong economy, which is dependent on efficient movement of people and goods to attract businesses and residents to the region. Air quality is also a regional concern impacted by emissions from vehicles on our congested highways. Quality of life is another regional goal affected by transportation priorities. Good roadway design, especially in our denser urban areas, can help transport interesting streets and places where people enjoy walking and shopping, attracting visitors to our region, and serving as vocal points for creating complete communities. And oftentimes, we talk about complete streets. But under my administration, I want to focus on complete communities. And even the fiscal health of our region is at stake. Our region has watched areas of low-density suburban communities expand over the recent decades, often in unincorporated areas. Many of these areas are now aging and increasingly need costly maintenance to their roads and utility infrastructure. Yet these low-density areas offer limited tax base that is vital to enable local government support for this maintenance. The potential deterioration of these areas is a regional challenge and a potential threat to our long-term fiscal health as a region. We need to better understand the significance of this challenge. All of these issues impact each other, so we, sh so we should consider all of them as we formulate our transportation strategy for the future. These interrelationships were well-defined last year when the city adopted Plan Houston as the city's first general plan. Now it's time, Councilmember Edwards, to focus on more specific, concrete steps for implementing this plan. Let me share some mobility strategies I believe are key to our regional success. Strategies that I believe take into account all of these objectives. What is required is a true paradigm shift for this region. Strategy one. We must encourage well-connected urban centers, transit-oriented development. The first strategy is to encourage well-connected, denser urban centers, or we could use the term transit-oriented development. We are already a region of multiple urban centers. Some are inside our city, such as downtown, the medical center, the West Chase District. Others are throughout the region, such as Sugarland, or the Woodlands, or Katy, or Baytown. We should also build on this model and create well-connected transit-oriented development throughout the regions. Having denser places with a mix of nearby uses means that you can live, work, and play in proximity to this area. When you add the right mix of infrastructure and design, this means more people will be able to walk or bike or ride transit for many of their travel needs. The density and mix of, use of, of, of users foster economic activity while reducing the need to get into a car for every trip, minimizing congestion. This approach also creates an opportunity for vibrant public spaces that are important for the region to be attractive and internationally competitive. From a regional perspective, we can then connect the centers together with strong multimodal investments, especially transit, further reducing vehicle tri trips in the region. How can we do this? From the public sector, we should prioritize our mobility investment 
to strengthen existing and new centers. We need to focus our limited funding in these areas where mobility demands are highest and the opportunities to create sustainable regional strategy is the greatest. A good example of this is the city's proposed dedicated bus lanes on Post Oak Boulevard. This project significantly enhances convenient access into the uptown area for residents across a broad sector of Houston, supporting the economic development of this area without requiring the use of a car. But public agencies can do more than just prioritizing mobility improvements. Our growth and development tools should also be used to encourage activity centers. The city of Houston has already done this. In 2009, the city passed a transit corridor ordinance which encourages compact, pedestrian-friendly development along Metro's light rail lines. The city of Houston and other agencies should continue to find other creative ways to coordinate land development with mobility investment. I challenge the private development community to also take advantage of these center approach. Well-designed development that enable a denser, walkable environment is good business. The popular city center development in West Houston is a good example of a successful, of a successful development project that follows this model and creates an enjoyable community asset. Other promising developments are on the horizon. The city stands ready to coordinate with developers who wish to follow this approach. Strategy two, multimodal approach. The second strategy is using a multimodal approach to providing for mobility needs. Historically, region's primary transportation strategy focused on moving single occupant vehicles. We have continued to add capacity to freeways and roadways. According to the Federal Highway Administration, in 2014, Houston ranked fifth in the nation's urban areas for the number of roadway miles per person. That was fifth. Yet all this concentration, construction, has not significantly reduced our congestion. Indeed, more roads have led to people driving more. The Katy Freeway is an excellent example. The region spent over $2 billion on the Katy Freeway expansion. This project was completed in 2008, making the Katy Freeway one of the widest freeways in the world. Yet, only seven years later, I-10 near Beltway 8 ranked as the eighth most congested freeway in the state of Texas. These roads create a significant challenge in terms of future maintenance costs. The city is already suffering from years of deferred roadway maintenance and underinvestment. The city's recent pothole initiatives is only a temporary fix. It is in need of a long-term solution. And in some cases, adding capacity actually detracts from quality of life. Our core urban areas have vibrant, enjoyable areas where walkability should be prioritized, in some cases even over an automobile. And widening streets can make the streets less appealing as a pedestrian. Houston's, Houston's lower West Timer area is a great example. This historic Montrose area is already compact and walkable, full of restaurants and street life, and is a treasured part of Houston's eclectic culture. The city should build on the strengths of this unique area by improving lower West Timer to enhance pedestrian activity and support the small businesses and the local neighborhoods. Clearly, we need a better way to efficiently move people. We need to move more people and commerce on existing infrastructure. The solution is to increasingly take advantage of other modes of travel to move people on existing roadways. This is one of the strategies that we need to employ for these areas that are much more dense. The city is already doing this in some respects. In 2013, the city formally embraced, via Mayor Parker's executive order, redirecting the creation of the Houston Complete Streets and Transportation Plan, a complete street approach to mobility maintenance. The city's public works and engineering department is fully implementing this philosophy by looking at potential needs for each travel mode for all street reconstruction projects. Some of these projects are now in design, but this doesn't mean we put a bike lane on every street. However, it does mean that we strategically consider the potential need for bicycles and other modes for every project, not just moving cars. 
metros, high occupancy vehicle, the HOV lanes, or another great example of a successful multimodal approach in Houston. This is a highly popular and effective system, connecting regional residential areas and employment centers with frequent convenient service. Last year, Metro, Metro had over 26 million riders on the HOV system, with over 100 miles of HOV lanes on five major corridors. We should look at, fut at the future of this system. The old model was primarily one of residential trips from suburban areas coming into employment centers in the urban core. But the region has also seen growth of jobs, destinations in, sub in suburbs, and additional residential inside the 610 loop. That's why we need two-way HOV lanes on all freeways. These growth patterns warrant frequent and reliable two-way systems. It enables two-way bus rapid transit on, H on, H on HOVs. We should consider HOV lanes on loop facilities as well, including Beltway 8 when reconstructed. And I encourage the HC Toll Road Authority to think creatively about these opportunities. And these same strategies, encouraging shared vehicle trips of all kinds, must be used on not just freeways, but also urban street grids, and the two must be well coordinated. The street grid and the inner core must distribute these trips coming off the freeway. The 2010 census shows that the city of Houston's daytime population increases by 577,000 daytime commuters Monday through Friday. That's a 27% increase. That is greater than the population of the city of Atlanta. So every single day, people coming from outside coming into the city of Houston increases our population by adding another Atlanta. Plus, Houston itself is becoming denser in our urban core. We must keep the urban core moving so that our residents can access job and other amenities. That is why finding ways to encourage shared trips on vehicles is critical to the vitality of the region. Transit and carpooling improves access to jobs and services. The bus system will be the backbone for moving more people quickly on limited street right of ways. Metro is to be commended for their system reimagining project. This innovative effort made the bus system more efficient with minimum additional resources. The system has more frequent bus routes, seven days a week. This year, the Metro system-wide ridership, including bus and rail, is up over 8% and now has over 320,000 passengers boarding per day for all modes, local, bus, park and ride, rail, HOV, HOT lanes, van pool, the Metro lift. But what is the next phase for Metro? I'll leave that in part to the new chairperson and the board. But how can we further use buses to move people quickly and reliably? I am pleased to have appointed Karen Patman who I know will bring visionary and innovative leadership to this agency. Express bus and bus rapid transit is one strategy we should, we should explore. Enabling faster, longer distance travel on some corridors, similar to Metro's quick line signature bus service on Bel Air, providing faster service with less frequent stops. Additional opportunities to optimize the bus system should be explored by implementing better technology and design on the city's roadway. The city stands ready to coordinate with Metro to identify opportunities to move buses quickly on city streets. Some traffic signals may, be, may, may need to be coordinated with buses to encourage faster mass transit. Other travel time advantage, offer travel time advantages for bus travel. As we get denser and our mobility, mobility needs grow, we will have to make choices on how to use limited space on streets to move more people faster. Some areas of our city now have the right density and mix of uses where these type of enhanced bus transit services or an opportunity to move more people quickly on our streets. West Timer outside the loop is a good example. Getting long range transit planning is needed to identify these opportunities. Metro has not adopted their long-range capital plan since 2003 when the Metro Solutions Plan was adopted. I urge Metro to update it and the city will be a partner. 
We must also look to change the culture of riding buses in Houston. Many people look at transit as only for the poor or hipsters. But if we are to provide for our mobility needs, did I use that term? <laughs> I may be old in numbers, but still young in heart. <laughs> but if we are to provide for our mobility needs, yet maintain the quality of life, transit must become an option that appeals to a wider spectrum of individuals. As existing riders know, transit already allows for, production, for, for productive or relaxing time for other things, and buses are increasingly frequent and convenient. Improving travel time, competitiveness for buses and other transit will be critical and crucial to increasing ridership. The light rail system, now three lines, holds promise in the urban core for moving people and spurring private investment. investment. The main street, the red line, has more boardings per mile than any other light rail system outside of San Francisco and Boston. The extension, the extension of light rail down US 98 corridor, as originally envisioned in Metro's 2003 plan, continues to be a promising opportunity to provide a convenient connection between Southwest Houston and the Texas Medical Center and downtown Houston. We know that this protects, that this project has significant right-of-way challenges and will require strong coordination with Union Pacific Railroad, who owns the adjacent right-of-way. Still, the region, region should continue to explore this project, and I am pleased that Congressman John Coverson has pledged his support for this evaluation. We need conven convenient transit connections from our urban centers to the region's major airports as well. Express bus or even light rail has potential for this connection and should also be evaluated. But I've made it very clear that as mayor of the city of Houston, even as it relates to light rail, that I will not force light rail on any community that does not want it. I will not do it. But I will encourage that we place light rail in communities and neighborhoods that do want it. it when I was growing up, my dad used to tell a story to us boys all the time. He said it was his, his dad was out plowing the field, and uh, he had to go inside the house. And so he asked his son to continue plowing the field. When the dad came back a couple hours later, the son was still at the same place where the dad left him. And so the father asked the son, why haven't you plowed any further than when I left? And the son said, dad, when you left, I ran across this stone, and I've been trying to plow up this stone. And the dad said to the son, son, you will never advance trying to plow up the stone. But let me tell you what you should have done. Plow around the stone, and then we'll plant the seeds, and the crop will grow. And in due time, no one will ever see the stone that was already here. Rail. We must stop trying to force it on places that do not want it and build it on and give it to neighborhoods and people in this city that do want it. And in time, those who don't have it or who are opposed to it, in time, they will recognize that they need to get on board. But I will not try to force a fit. Commuter rail, using heavier train technology, is another option to provide a high capacity, longer distance transit from the suburban areas uh, further in, out this, in this region. This option has significant costs, but as need increases, it should be looked at closely. And we should support high speed Houston Dallas passenger rail. Now notice I said high speed Houston <laughs> Dallas passenger rail. As much as I like Dallas, it's not Dallas, Houston. It's Houston, Dallas. We are the fourth largest city, soon to be the third, the most diverse. Houston must stop being second to any other city in this state or in this country and be who we are. I 
I support it. I believe that this high-speed train coming from Houston to Dallas, Dallas to Houston, would add another signature moment for this state and for this region. It is also futuristic. This is a huge opportunity to improve Texas economy, enhance mobility, and create transit-oriented uh, development. Offers potential for traveling between Houston and Dallas in 90 minutes. This city is coordinating closely with the private company, Texas Central Partners, to help make this a reality. I know it will not be easy, and I know there are a lot of small towns between the two that may not want it. But I hope we will do everything we can to advance it, because it will not only benefit these two areas, these two regions, it will benefit the state of Texas as a whole. And we will do everything we can to find the suitable and best stop for the train, whether it is in downtown or the Northwest Transit city, uh, Station, but it certainly needs to be in the city of Houston. And then there are other options as well. I've talked a lot about bicycles and hiking bike trails. We are moving aggressively in that direction. And we need to build a, a city that is more walkable, pedestrian friendly. And we don't start building that design tomorrow. We need to start doing that right now. In the 1990s, we made some decisions that were in fact impacting us today. This will always be, we will always be a roadway capacity in this state. That will not change. But we should not limit ourselves just to roadway capacity. It must be multimodal in concept or we will lose our competitive aid edge. Strategy number three, efficient freight system. The third strategy is to continue to improve the efficiency and safety of systems that move the region's freights and goods. And I certainly want to acknowledge the county judge, Ed Emmett, for doing an outstanding job in leading the study in this particular area. The freight movement is vital for the region's economic health. The Port of Houston has been ranked second in the United States in total tonnage for 23 consecutive years and consistently ranks first in foreign waterborne tonnage, first in U.S. imports, and first in, in U.S. export tonnage. A key part of freight movement is the region's railroad network. Our railways lay the foundation for our economic strength. This system also helps relieve congestion overall by reducing the number of trucks on our roadways. Still, the freight rail system is now surrounded by fully developed communities, especially in the urban core. This leads to a number of challenges for our community. Too often, trains end up blocking our roadway crossings, frustrating commuters. Train horn noise affects quality of life in our neighborhoods, and the railroads themselves have their own capacity limitations, reducing the efficiency of freight movement and inhibiting our economy. Several strategies will have addressed these challenges. More grade separated uh, rail crossings are needed, especially in our urban core. Overpasses and underpasses help unclog our mobility arteries by allowing efficient movement of people while trains cross roadways. Adding freight rail capacity can also help move si trains through our region more quickly, reducing conflicts with our roadways. And quiet zone improvements help reduce train horn noise in nearby neighborhoods, allowing residents to sleep at night well. The private rail company should be our partner in implementing these strategies. Building an overpass does more than simply benefit the commu commuter, but it also greatly benefits private rail companies by reducing liability costs and relieving pressure from the community that is ultimately their customer. Rail companies must be at the table in helping to fund these improvements, and the city stands ready to partner with all rail railroads to improve the system for all users. Strategy four, strategic funding pursuit. You can't have all these good things and expect it to come without a cost. The next approach I simply want to highlight is to be more strategic in pr pursuing mobility funding. We need funding to implement the, str the strategies I've highlighted. I appreciate the beneficial role of groups like TAG. Funding has been shrinking in this state. Funding for highways, the state gas tax was last raised 25 years ago in 1991, now we're at 20 cents a gallon. The federal gas tax was last raised 23 years ago, 1993, now 18.4 cents a gallon. The gas tax have not been indexed for inflation. 
more fuel efficient vehicles results in shrinking gas tax revenues per vehicle. The motor vehicle registration fees between $40 and $60 a year last raised 31 years ago in 1985. Texans pay less in transportation fees than residents of 43 other states. We need to identify ways to increase public funding. States should allow local funding options. If the state will not increase gas tax or index to inflation, the state should at least allow citizens to utilize other options to fund transportation improvements. But we need to look beyond just how much funding. We also need to focus on the right structure of funding. It needs to be more flexibility. We need the state and the federal funding to allow for not just roadway capacity, but we need flexibility to also support other travel modes. The state's proposition funding, such as Proposition 1 and 7, in 2014 and 2015 respectively, were generally limited to roadway improvements. This limits the flexibility the region needs to fund improvements for other transportation modes. In the last two elections, in both of these propositions, strong support came from the urban centers like Dallas and Houston. But I can also recall during the last legislative session, at about 2 a.m. in the morning, there was an amendment filed to restrict TxDOT just to road capacity alone. And the cities, the urban cities throughout the state, like Dallas and San Antonio and Fort Worth and Houston, fought that amendment off. And we killed that amendment with the understanding that TxDOT must now be consistent with the new day, that we cannot just focus on road construction. We need to look at multimodal. And the sooner the cities get together and recognize that there are more people in, the, in these urban centers and the funding that's appropriated must benefit the urban centers, the better off we will all be. And so when we are voting on these propositions, it does no good for propositions to come up and people in Houston and Dallas vote overwhelmingly for them but we are also limiting the flexibility of the use of those dollars. We do on one hand a good thing, but on the other hand, we were not futuristic in our thinking because when it comes now to the allocation of those dollars, we are losing out, even though most of the votes came from Houston and Dallas and other major areas. And the same thing applies to federal legislation. We need more flexibility. Our priorities for highway funding must be revisited as well. As we spend highway fund funding, we should prioritize in fixing what we have first rather than adding more. Where new highway capacity is needed, it should address existing congestion rather than new or wider roads for purposes of encouraging land development. We must focus highway investment in the urban core where connectivity needs and congestion strains are the great greatest. And finally, I believe the private sector should also be looked at for helping to fund transportation projects and many mobility improvements directly enhance the private interest. Strategy five is agency coordination, partnership. My fifth and final suggestion is enhanced coordination and partnership of regional agencies. There are many agencies that work together to provide for the mobility needs of our community. The city, TxDOT, Metro, the county, Gulf Coast, Rail District, the port, and I certainly want to acknowledge TxDOT because Quincy has just been a big and huge partner with the city of Houston and Public Works, and I want you to know I am very appreciative and very thankful. <laughs> and at the same time, I don't want to beat up on them too bad when I need their help. <laughs> I'm not crazy. <laughs> so TxDOT does excellent work, Commissioner. You know, uh, excellent work. Uh, Excellent work. <laughs> we just need more of, your, of the funding in the Houston region, okay? Uh, and these agencies already coordinate extensively, but we should expand this collaboration. Our users expect a seamless system that works together. Other users expect a seamless system that's working along with one another. 
That means when one agency makes improvements, it should consider how these improvements affect the system of the others. And we should consult with each other early and often. Uh, and lastly, the example is with I-45. That's a major project, the rerouting of I-45 around downtown Houston. That's going to require a great deal of collaboration. And again, I want to thank Techstock and Quincy for working with Public Works and others in this project. That project stands to cost $6 billion when the expanding of I-10 was right at $2 billion. But the opportunities from that project are endless, and I hope we will move forward on that in a very positive fashion. In conclusion, these are my thoughts. And I believe working collaboratively and together, they will serve us well. Working together, we can accomplish more than going alone. But we must be dedicated and act with conviction and in unison to achieve our objectives. What I am describing is a true paradigm shift for the region. But we must embrace it fully to ensure Houston region sustains its place as a healthy and globally competitive system. We all have obligations to think of those who will live and work here after we are gone. We will not be here forever. But the critical question is what sort of transportation network will we leave for the future? Or 10 years from now, or 20 years from now, will they be dealing with the same issues that we are dealing with today? I do not intend to run for another office when I leave this office of being mayor. And I am fully committed to making sure we do all that we can, that we do not repeat the mistakes of the past, that we build a transportation network that will meet the, com the economic interests of the people that exist in our region, that we provide a system that can move people efficiently and effectively from point A to point B, that we are futuristic in our approach, and that we are not bound or limited by the lack of resources. It will take bold leadership to ask people to do more, to pay more, to give more, but you cannot have more if you're not willing to do more and pay more. Our region depends on the decisions we make today and tomorrow. And so let us go boldly into the future and let us recognize that we are not just competing with Dallas, we are competing with cities across the globe. And let's build a transportation network that when they get off the plane and reach our destination, they can move from point A to point B and they recognize that in this city and in this region, we are not just thinking about today, we are thinking and acting on tomorrow. And if we do it together, Houston and the Houston region can lead the way. I look forward to working with you and making that happen.